Tale of the Second Calendar Indeed, Mistress, neither was I born with one eye only, and the story which I am going to tell you is so marvelous that, if it were written with a needle on the inner corner of any eye, yet would it serve as a lesson to the circumspect. Though you see me thus, I am a king and the son of a king, a man of education beyond the ordinary. I have read the Quran with all its seven narratives, I have read all essential books and the writings of the masters of science, I have studied the lore of the stars and the star-like lore of the poets. So rapidly did I learn that I surpassed in knowledge all the men of my time. Especially did my fame spread abroad as a calligrapher, I became renowned in all countries and my worth was known among kings. So it happened that the king of Hind heard tell of me and sent begging my father to let me visit him. This invitation he accompanied with sumptuous gifts and presents meat for us, so my father consented and fitted out six ships for me with all manner of luxuries, and I departed. After a month's voyage, we came to land and, unshipping the horses and camels we had with us, loaded them with presents for the king of Hind and set out on our journey. But hardly had we started than a great dust storm rose, filling all the sky and the earth with sand for the space of an hour. When it died down, we found close upon us a troop of sixty armed men, raging like lions, desert Arabs, cut purses of the highway. We turned and fled, but, when they saw our ten camels loaded with gifts for the king of Hind, they pursued us at a gallop. So we signed to them with our finger that we were envoys to the mighty king and should not be molested. But they answered, We know nothing of kings, and forthwith killed some of my slaves. The rest of us took to flight in all directions, I with a great and terrible wound, while the Arabs contented themselves with pillaging our rich belongings. I fled and I fled, despairing bitterly at my change of fortune, till I came to the top of a mountain, where I found a cave in which I passed the night. Next morning I left the cave and journeyed on until I came to a great and beautiful city, whose air was of such potent balm that winter might not lay hand upon her but the spring covered her with his roses all the year. I wept with joy when I reached the city, being fatigued and broken by my journey, worn and pale from my wound and utterly changed from my former state. I was wandering ignorantly about the streets when I passed a tailor sewing in his shop, whom I greeted and who greeted me. He cordially invited me to seat myself, embraced me, and asked me generous questions about my wanderings. I told him all that had befallen me from beginning to end and he was much moved at my recital, saying to me, My sweet young man, you must on no account tell this story to any other person here, for the king of the city is a deadly enemy of your father, having an old grudge against him, and I fear for your safety he gave me food and drink, and we ate and drank together. After a long conversation, he brought out a mattress and a quilt for me, and let me sleep that night in a corner of his shop. I stayed with him for three days, and at the end of that time he asked if I knew any trade by which I could earn a livelihood. Certainly I do, I answered, I am deeply read in the law. I am a past master of all sciences, literature, and computation are thoroughly well known to me. My friend, he answered all that is not a trade, or rather, if you wish, it is a trade if ever he saw that I was annoyed, but it is not of very much account in the markets of our city. No one here knows anything of study or of writing or of reading, they simply know how to make money. I could only answer that I knew nothing beside these things. Said he, Come, my son, pull yourself together, take an axe and a cord, go out and cut wood in the countryside till Allah show you a better occupation. Above all, 
Tell your story to no one or they will kill you. With this the good man bought me an axe and a rope, and sent me out in charge of a gang of woodcutters, under whose special care he placed me. I went out with the woodcutters and, when I had chopped sufficient faggots, loaded them on my head and sold them in the streets of the city for half a dinar. With a little of this money I bought food, and the rest I carefully put aside. I laboured in this way for a full year, visiting my friend the tailor in his shop every day and resting there in my corner without having to pay him anything. Point one day, straying away from the others, I came to a thickly wooded glade where there were many faggots to be had. I chose a dead tree and was beginning to loosen the earth about her roots when the head of my axe was caught in a copper ring. I removed the earth all about this ring and, coming to a wooden cover in which it was fastened, lifted it and found an underground staircase. In my curiosity I went down the stairs to the bottom and, opening a door, entered the mighty hall of a most marvelous palace. In this hall there was a young girl, more beautiful than all the pearls of history, I had endured much and yet at the sight of her all my troubles were left behind and I knelt down in adoration before Allah who had molded so perfect a beauty out of the centuries. She looked at me and said, Are you a man or a genie? A man, I answered, and she asked, Who then has led you to this hall where for full twenty years I have not seen a human face? I found her words and herself so sweet that I answered, Lady, it was Allah who led me to your home that all my troubles and my sorrows might be forgotten. I told her my story from beginning to end, she wept for me and told me her story likewise I am the daughter of King Ifatam Asterisk S, latest of the kings of Hind and master of the Isle of Ebony. I was to be married to my cousin, but on my wedding night, even before my virginity had been taken, the Ifrit Jurgis, son of Rajm Asterisk S, son of the foul fiend himself, carried me off and put me in this place, which he had provisioned with all I could desire of sweet things and of jams, of robes and precious stuffs, of furniture and meat and drink. Since then he has come to see me every ten days and lies one night with me, going away in the morning. Also he has told me that if I have need of him during the ten days that he is away I have nothing to do but to touch with my hand two lines which are written under the cupola of that little room. If I but touch them he will appear at once. It is four days since he has been here, so that there will be six more before he comes again. Therefore you can stay with me for five days and go away on the day before he comes most certainly I can. I answered, and she was filled with joy. She got up from where she was lying and, taking me by the hand, led me through many arched apartments to a warm agreeable hammam where all the air was scented. Here we both undressed naked and bathed together. After our bath, we sat side by side on the hammam couch and she regaled me with musk sweetened sherbet and delicious cakes. We talked for a long time and ate unsparingly of the provisions of the Ifrit who had ravished her. At last she said, For this evening you had better sleep and rest after all your toil, you will be the more ready for me then. I was indeed weary, so I thanked her and lay down to sleep. Forgetting all my cares. When I woke, I found her by my side, pleasantly massaging my limbs and my feet. So I called down all the blessings of Allah upon her, and we sat together for an hour saying sweet things to each other. As God lives, she sighed at last, before you came, I was all alone in this underground palace for twenty years, no one to speak to with no companion save sorrow and a bosom filled by sobs, but now glory be to Allah that he has brought you to me. Then in a sweet voice she sang the song for your feet. If we had known of your coming, 
we would have been weaving our heart's blood the velvet of our eyes to a red and black carpet dot for your couch if we had known of your coming, we would have been spreading our cool cheeks the young silk of our thighs, dear stranger in the night. Hand on heart I thanked her for her song, my love for her increased in me and all my sorrows fell away. We drank together from the same cup till nightfall, and all night I lay with her in a heaven of bliss. Never was such a night, and, when morning came, we rose in love with each other and with happiness. I was still all passion and, thinking to prolong my rapture, I said, Shall I not take you from this underground place and free you from the genie? Be quiet, she answered, laughing, and be content with what you have. The poor Ifrit has only one night in ten, I promise you all the other nine. But I, lifted by passion and by wine, spoke thus extravagantly, not so. I am going to destroy that alcove with its magic inscription, and then the Ifrit will come and I shall kill him. For a long time it has been my custom to amuse myself by killing Ifrit to calm my frenzy she recited these lines you who would bind love thinking to make us yours by the binding soon shall discover ever a lover finishes finding love will forsake us the bound and unkind love but if you unbind love he'll wrap us and take us in nets of his winding and never be over. But, paying no attention to the lines, I gave a violent kick with my foot at the wall of the alcove. At this point Charizard saw the approach of morning and discreetly fell silent. And when the thirteenth night had come she said it is related, O auspicious king, that the second calendar continued telling his story to the young mistress of the house in these words mistress, when I kicked down the alcove, the woman cried, the Ifrit is upon us. Did I not warn you? As all lives, you have destroyed me. Flee by the way you came and save yourself. I rushed to the staircase, forgetting my sandals and my axe in the hurry of my terror. When I had climbed a few steps, I remembered them and went back to look for them, but the earth opened and an ifrit of terrible size and ugliness sprang from it, crying to the woman, What does all this violence mean? It frightened me. What harm has befallen you? No harm, she answered, save that, just now, I felt my heart heavy with solitude and, Rising to get some drink to lighten it, I fell against the alcove. But the Ifrit, who had looked about the hall and seen my sandals and my axe, cried, Oh, and what are these things, you lying whore? Tell me, what man do they belong to? I never saw them before you showed them to me, she answered. Probably they were hanging to the back of your clothes and you brought them here yourself. Weak and tortuous and foolish words, exclaimed the furious Jenny they will not take me in, you wanton. On this, he stripped her naked, crucified her between four pegs fastened in the earth, and, putting her to the torture, began to question her. I could not bear to see this or to hear her sobs, so I ran trembling up the stairs and, reaching the outer air, put back the cover and removed all traces of the entrance. I repented bitterly of the foolish thing I had done, thinking of the girl's beauty and of all the torture which the wretch who had kept her there for twenty years had inflicted on her for my sake. From this I fell to lamenting my father, my own lost kingdom, and the miserable descent I had made to be a woodcutter. So I wept and recited a suitable verse. Making my way to the city, I found that my friend the tailor had been, as the saying is, on coals of fire at my absence. In his anxiety, he called to me, when you did not come yesterday, my heart lay awake all night because of you. I feared that a savage beast or other mischance had destroyed you in the forest. 
Praise be to Allah that you are safe. Thanking him and sitting down in my accustomed corner, I began to brood on what had happened and to curse myself for the unlucky kick that I had given the alcove. All of a sudden my good friend the tailor came to me, saying, There is a man at the shop door, a Persian, who has your axe and your sandals and is asking for you. He has been going round all the woodcutters in the street, saying that he found them in the road when he went out to pray at dawn at the call of the muezzin. Some of the woodcutters recognized them and directed the Persian to come here. He is outside the door, go and thank him for his trouble, and take your sandals and your axe again. I paled and nearly fainted at his words and, while I stayed prostrate where I was, the ground in front of my corner opened and the Persian leapt from it, showing himself to be the Ifrit. You must know that he had put the young woman to terrible tortures without getting her to admit anything, and so, taking up my axe and sandals, had said, I will show you that I am indeed Jurgis of the true seed of the evil one. You shall see whether or no I can find the owner of these things. And, as I have told you, he tracked me among the woodcutters by a trick. Swiftly he came to me, swiftly lifted me, and flew with me high into the air. When I had lost consciousness, he plunged with me down through the earth to the palace where I had tasted so much lustful bliss. When I saw the girl, naked and with blood flowing from her flanks, I wept bitterly. But the Ifrit, going to her and seizing her arm, said, Here is your lover, you licentious bitch. The girl looked me straight in the face, saying, I do not know him. I have never seen him before. What? shrieked the Ifrit, here is the very body that you sinned with and you deny it. But she continued, saying, I do not know him. I have never seen him in my life, nor would it be right for me to lie in the face of God. If that is so, said the Ifrit, take this sword and cut off his head. She took the sword and stopped before me. Yellow with fear and weeping copiously, I signed to her with my eyebrows to spare me. She winked at me, saying at the same time in a loud voice, You are the cause of all our troubles. I signed to her again with my eyebrows, at the same time reciting these ordinary lines, whose inner significance the Ifrit could not understand I could not say I had a secret for your ears, but my eyes said so. I could not say that you had caused my tears, but my eyes said so. I could not say my fingers mean I love you I could not say my brows are meant to move you, I could not say my heart is here to prove you but my eyes said so. The poor girl understood my signs and my verses, and therefore, threw the sword at the feet of the Ifrit, who picked it up and handed it to me. Cut off her head, he said, and you shall depart free and unharmed. Certainly, I answered, grasping the sword, stepping forward and raising my arm, but she said with her brows, Did I betray you? So I wept and threw away the sword, saying to the Ifrit, Great Jenny, Robust unconquerable hero, if she, who being a woman has neither faith nor reason, found it unlawful to cut off my head and threw away the sword, how can I, who am a man, find it lawful to cut off her head, especially as I have never seen her before? Even if you make me drink the bitterest cup of death I shall not do so. Ah, now I know that there is love between you said the Ifrit, then, mistress, that devil cut off both the hands and both the feet of the poor girl with four strokes of the sword, so that I thought I should die of grief at the sight. But even so she looked at me sideways and winked at me and, alas, the Ifrit saw the wink. O oh, harlot's daughter, he cried, would you commit adultery with your eyes? 
So saying, he cut off her head with the sword and, turning to me, addressed me in these words, Learn, O human, that among us jinn it is allowed, and even praiseworthy, to kill an adulteress. I bore away this girl on her wedding night, when she was but twelve years old and still unknown of man. I brought her here and visited her every tenth day, coupling with her in the form of a Persian. Finding her unfaithful, I have killed her. For she was unfaithful, even if it was only with her eye. As for you, since I am not sure that you have fornicated with her, I will not kill you. But, so that you may not laugh at me behind my back, I shall inflict some evil upon you to bring down your pride. Now choose what evil you would prefer naturally, good lady, I rejoiced to the utmost when I saw that I should escape with my life and this encouraged me to take advantage of the Ifrit's clemency. Therefore I said, I find it very hard to choose one out of all the evils that there are. I think I would prefer none. The Ifrit stamped in vexation and said, I told you to choose, choose quickly, then, into what form I shall change you. What, an ass, a dog, a mule, a crow, an ape. I answered still facetiously, hoping for pardon, as all alive's, Master Jurgis of the great tribe of the evil one, if you spare me Allah will spare you. Well he knows how to reward one who pardons a good Moslem that has done no harm. I went on praying and humbling myself in vain, until he cut me short, saying, No more words, or I shall kill you. Do not try to take advantage of my goodness, for I am fully determined to bewitch you in some way. Straightway he caught me up, broke all the palace and the earth about us, and flew so high with me up into the air that the earth appeared below me in the likeness of a little dish of water. At last he set me down on the top of a high mountain, and, taking a handful of the earth, mumbled some words over it. Then he muttered, hum, 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 and threw it over me, crying, come out of that shape and be an ape. On the instant I became an ape, at least a hundred years old and as foul-faced as hell itself. Seeing myself in this form, I jumped about in grief and found myself capable of prodigious leaps. But these did me no good, so I sat down and wept, whereat the Ifrit laughed in a terrible fashion and disappeared. After I had remained there for some time, thinking on the injustice of fate and how it regards not any man, I leapt and gambled from the top of the mountain to its base, then I set out, walking by day and sleeping by night in the trees, until after a month I came to the beach of the Salt Sea. I had rested there for an hour when I saw a ship coming up with a favorable breeze out of the sea. I hid behind a rock and waited. After there had been much coming and going among the men, I screwed up my courage and leapt into the ship. Chase the ill omened beast out of that, cried one of the men. No, kill it, cried another. Yes, kill it with a sword cried out a third. At this I caught the sword with my paw and burst into bitter tears. Because of my tears the captain had pity on me and said to those about him, This ape has asked for my protection and I give it him. Let no one take hold of him or chase him or interfere with him. Then he called me to him and spoke kind words to me, all of which I understood. Finally he made me his servant on the boat, and in this duty I did everything correctly for him throughout the voyage. Favoring winds carried us, after fifty days, to a city so great and so populous that Allah alone could count the people of it. As we cast anchor, certain officers of the king of that place came and welcomed the merchants we had aboard and gave them, with the kind greetings of the king, a roll of 
parchment on which each man was commanded to inscribe a line in his fairest writing. For the king's wazir, a great calligraphist, had died and the king had sworn to appoint no one in his place who could not write as well as he dot ape that I was, I snatched the parchment from their hands and fled away with it, so that they were afraid that I would tear it and throw it into the water. Some were trying to coax me and some to kill me, when I made a sign that I wished to write. Then said the captain, let him write. If he only scribbles and messes we can stop him, but if he writes with a fair writing I shall adopt him as my son, for never in my life have I seen an ape so learned I took the reed pen and, pressing it upon the pad of the ink pot, carefully spread ink on both its faces, and began to write. I improvised four stanzas, each in a different character and style, the first in Rikai the giver has been sung since time was new but givers with a hand like yours are few so first and foremost we will, look, to God and when he fails us we will look to you. The second in Rehani I'll tell you of this pen. It is of those pens that are mightier than cedar bows he holds it in five fingers of his hand and from it pour five rivers of pure prose. The third in Thuluthi I'll tell you of his immortality. He is so certain of eternity it is his aim to write such things of him as that last critic shall not blush to see. And the fourth in Muhakak ink is the strongest drug that God has made, if you can write of beauty unafraid you will be praising him who gave the ink more than all prayers unlearned men have prayed. When I had finished writing, I handed back the parchment and each of the others, marveling at what I had done also wrote a line in the fairest script that he could compass. Slaves bore the parchment back to the king and of all the writings he was only satisfied with mine, inscribed as they were in four different styles for which, when I had been a prince, I had been famed throughout the whole world. So the king said to his friends and to his slaves, Go all of you to this master of fair writing, give him this robe of honor to put on, Mount him on the most magnificent of my mules, and bring him to me in a triumph of musical instruments. They all smiled when he said this, so the king became angry and cried how is this? I give you an order and you laugh at me. King of all time, they answered, we would never dare to laugh at any word you said but we must tell you that the writer of these splendid characters is no man at all but an ape belonging to a ship's captain. The king was first astonished at their words and then convulsed with spacious laughter. I shall buy that ape, he said, and he ordered all the people of his court to go down to the boat and fetch the ape ashore taking with them both the mule and the robe of honor. Yes, yes, he added. Certainly you must clothe him in this robe and bring him to me mounted on the mule. All of them came down straightway to the boat and bought me at a great price from the captain, who found it hard to let me go. Then they dressed me in the robe of honor, after I had signed to the captain all my grief at leaving him, set me upon the mule, and conducted me through the city to the noise of harmonious instruments. You may imagine that every soul in those streets was stricken with wonder and admiration at such an unusual sight. When I was brought before the king, I kissed the earth between his hands three times and stood still in front of him. He invited me to sit down and I did so with such grace that all who were there, but especially the king, marveled at my fine education and the politeness of my behavior. When I was seated, the king sent all away except his chief eunuch, a certain young favorite slave, and myself. Then, to my delight, he ordered food, and slaves brought a cloth laid with all such meats and delicacies as the soul could possibly desire. The king signed to me to eat. So, after rising and kissing the earth between his hands according to seven different schools of politeness, I sat down again in my best manner and began to eat, diligently recalling the education of my youth at every point. Finally, 
when the cloth was drawn, I rose, washed my hands and, returning to the king, took up an ink pot, a reed, and a sheet of parchment. On the last I inscribed these few lines, celebrating the excellence of Arabian pastries sweet fine pastries rolled between white fingers, fried things whose fat scent lingers on him who in his haste tries to eat enough. Pastries, my love. Kunafa swimming in butter, bearded with ripe vermicelli, God has not given my belly half of the words it would utter of Kunifa's sweetness and syrup completeness. Kunifa lies on the table isled in a sweet brown oil, would I not wander and toil seventy years to be able to eat in paradise Kunifa's subtleties, finishing, I put down the reed and the sheet and, while the king looked in astonishment at what I had written, sat respectfully at a distance. But how can an ape compass such a thing? asked the king. As Allah lives, it surpasses all the marvels of history. Just then they brought the king his chessboard, and, when he had asked me by signs if I played and I had nodded my head to show him that I did, I arranged the pieces and we settled down to play. Twice I beat him, and he did not know what to think of it, saying, If this was a man, he would be the wisest man of all our time. And to his eunuch he continued, Go to our daughter and tell her to come quickly to us, for I wish your mistress to enjoy the sight of this remarkable ape. The eunuch went out and soon returned with the princess, his young mistress, who as soon as she set eyes on me covered her face with her veil, saying, Father, what has possessed you to send for me into the presence and sight of a strange man? Daughter, answered the king, here are only my young slave who is still a little boy, the eunuch who brought you up, this ape, and your father. Why do you cover your face? Then she said, No, my father, that this ape is a prince, his father is the king Iphidamaris ruler of a land far in the interior. The ape is bewitched by the Ephrit of the line of Ibli, who has also killed his own wife, daughter of King Iphitam Asterisk S, master of the Isle of Ebony. This which you think an ape is not only a man, but a learned, wise, and educated man as well. Is it true, what my daughter says of you? asked the king looking at me fixedly in his astonishment. I nodded and began to weep, so the king, turning to his daughter, asked her how she knew that I was bewitched. Father, she answered, when I was little there was an old woman in my mother's house, a sorceress knowing all the shifts and formulas of witchcraft, who taught me magic. Since then I have studied even more deeply and now know nearly a hundred and seventy codes of necromancy, by the least of which I could remove your palace, with all its stones, even the whole city itself, to the other side of Mount Kaf and turn your country to a sheet of water in which the people should swim in the form of fishes then by the truth of the name of Allah, cried the king. Take off the witchcraft from this poor young man and I will make him my wazir. It is strange indeed that you should have such art and I did not know it. Take off the witchcraft quickly, for he is both polite and wise. With all my heart and as in duty bound, answered the princess. At this point Charizad saw the approach of morning and discreetly fell silent. But when the fourteenth night had come, she said it is related, O auspicious king, that the second calendar thus continued his say to the mistress of the house. The princess took in her hands a knife on which were graved words in the Hebrew tongue and with it traced a circle in the middle of the palace which she filled with names of power and talismanic lines. This preparation completed, she stood in the middle of the circle murmuring words of magic import and reading from a book so old that none might understand it. After a few minutes of this, the palace became dark with shadows, 
so thick that we thought to be buried alive under the ruins of the world. Suddenly the Ifrit Jurgis stood before us in his most frightful and repellent guise, with hands like hayforks, legs like masts, and eyes like crucibles of fire. We were all driven to the confines of terror except the princess, who said, I have no welcome for you, I have no greeting. Then said the Ifrit, How can you break your word, O traitress? Did we not swear together that neither would use power against the other, nor interfere with the other's doings? Perfidious one, well have you deserved the fate which is about to overtake you thus. On the instant he turned into a savage lion which opened wide its throat and hurled itself upon the princess. But as quick as light she plucked a hair from her head and whispered magic words to it, so that it became a sharp sword, with which she cut the lion in two. Dot then we saw the lion's head become a scorpion which scuttled towards the young girl's heel to bite it, but in the nick of time she changed to a mighty serpent which threw itself upon the naughty scorpion and battled with it for a long while. Dot the scorpion, escaping, turned into a vulture, and the snake became an eagle, which flew at the vulture and put it to flight. The pursuit lasted for an hour, until the vulture became a black cat and the girl turned suddenly to a wolf. Long and long in the middle of the palace the cat and the wolf were locked in deadly strife, till the cat, seeing that it was being vanquished, turned into a very large red pomegranate, which leapt into the basin of the fountain in the courtyard. The wolf jumped in after it and was about to seize it when the pomegranate rose up into the air. But it was too heavy to be sustained there, and so fell with a thump onto the marble and broke in pieces, the seeds of it escaping one by one and covering the whole floor of the courtyard. On this the wolf changed to a cock who pecked at the seeds and swallowed them one by one, till only a single seed remained. Just as the cock was about to swallow this last one, it fell from his beak in this you may perceive the hand of destiny and the will of fate and lodged in a crack of the marble near the basin, so that the cock could not find it. Dot thereupon the cock crowed, beat his wings, and signed to us with his beak, but we did not understand what he would say to us. At last he gave so terrible a cry that we, who could not understand what he wished, thought that the palace was falling about us. Round and round, in the middle of the courtyard, trotted the cock until it found the last seed in the crack near the basin. But, when the cock had fetched it out and was about to eat it, the seed fell into the water and became a fish which swam to the bottom. So the cock turned to a whale of prodigious size which leapt into the water and sank in pursuit of the fish, so that we did not see it again for a whole hour. At the end of this time we heard agonized cries coming from the water and trembled for fear. Out of the basin appeared the Ifrit in his own form, but all on fire, as if he were a burning coal, with smoke leaping from his eyes and mouth and nose. Behind him appeared the princess in her own form, but she also was all on fire as if she were made of molten metal, and she ran after the Ifrit who was now bearing down on us. We were all terrified of being burnt alive and were on the point of throwing ourselves into the water, when the Ifrit halted us with a terrible cry and leaping upon us, in the midst of the hall which gave upon the courtyard, blew fire in our faces. But the princess caught up with him and blew fire in his face, so that flames fell on us from both of them. Those coming from her were harmless to us, but a spark, shooting off from him, destroyed my left eye forever, another burnt all the lower part of the king's face, his beard, and his mouth, making his lower teeth fall out, while a third, falling upon the eunuch's breast, burnt him to death upon the instant. All this time the young girl was pursuing the Ifrit and blowing fire at him. 
Suddenly we heard a voice calling, Only Allah is great. Only Allah is strong. He breaks and destroys the renegade who denies Muhammad, master of the world. It was the princess who spoke, pointing at the same time to the Ifrit who had been reduced to a mass of cinders. Coming to us, the princess said, Quick, fetch me a glass of water. When this was brought, she chanted certain incomprehensible words over it, and sprinkled me with water, saying, Be freed, in the name and by the truth of the only truth, yeah, by the truth of the name of Almighty Allah, return to your first shape. On this I became a man as I had been before, except that I was still blind of one eye. Poor youth! said the princess by way of consolation, fire will be fire. She said the same also to her father on account of his burnt beard and lost teeth, and finally she said, Father, I must die, for it is written. Had the Ifrit been but a man I could have killed him at the first attempt. It was the spilling of the pomegranate seed that was my undoing, for the grain I could not eat was that which held the whole soul of the jinni. If only I could have found it he would have been dead upon the instant, but, alas, I could not. It was written. So I was obliged to fight terrible battles below the earth and in the air and under the water, and each time he opened a door of safety I opened a door of danger, until at last he opened the terrible door of fire. When that door is opened there is death toward. Fate allowed me to burn him before I was burnt myself. Before I killed him I tried to make him embrace our faith, the blessed law of Islam, but he would not and I burnt him. Now I die. May Allah fill my place for you after this she wrestled with the fire till black sparks sprang up and mounted to her breast and to her face. When they reached her face, she cried out weeping, I bear witness that there is no God but Allah, I bear witness that Muhammad is his messenger, and fell, a heap of cinders, by the side of the Ifrit. We mourned for her, and I wished that I could have died in her place rather than see her radiant form go down in ashes, this little princess who had freed me, but the word of Allah may not be gainsaid. When the king saw his daughter fall down in cinders, he tore away the little remnant of his beard, beat his cheeks, and rent his garments. I did the same and we both wept over her, until the chamberlains and the chief men of the court came and found their sultan fainting and weeping beside two piles of ashes. For an hour, in great stupefaction, they walked round and round the king not daring to speak, until at last he recovered himself a little and told them all that had happened to his daughter. Then they cried, Allah Allah, the great grief, the great calamity. Lastly came the women and the women slaves, who mourned for seven days and lamented over her in due form. When the week was past, the king ordered a mighty tomb to be built over the ashes of his child, and this was done by forced labor at the same hour, and candles and lanterns were lighted by it both day and night. But the ashes of the Ifrit were committed to the air, under the curse of Allah. Worn out by these griefs and duties, the Sultan fell into a sickness which looked to be mortal and lasted for a whole month. When his strength had come back to him a little, he called me to him and said, Young man, before you came we lived here in eternal happiness, safe harbored from the assaults of fortune, but with your coming came also the bitterest of all afflictions. Would we had never seen your ill omened face, your face which brought down desolation on us. First, you have caused the death of my daughter whose life was worth the lives of a hundred men. Second, you were the reason of my being burnt and of the loss and spoiling of my teeth. Third, through you my poor eunuch, 
that faithful servant who had reared my daughter, was killed outright. And yet it is not your fault, nor is the remedy yours, what came to us and to you, came from Allah. Praise be to him, then, who allowed my daughter to free you even at the price of her own life. Yes, it is destiny, it is destiny. Leave our country, my child, for we have suffered enough because of you. Yet it was all written before by Allah, so go your way in peace. Mistress, I went out from before the king, hardly believing that he was still alive and not knowing at all where to go. In my heart I pondered all that had happened to me from beginning to end, how I had escaped safe from the desert robbers, how I had entered as a stranger into a city and met the tailor there, my sweet amour with the young girl below the earth, my deliverance from the hands of the Ifrit, my life as an ape servant to a ship's captain, my purchase at a great price by the king. Because of my excellent handwriting, my freeing from the spell, and, last and most piteous, the adventure that had lost me my eye. Nevertheless I thanked Allah saying, Better an eye than a life, and went down to the hammam to bathe before leaving the city. It was there my lady, that I shaved my beard so that I might travel in safety in the guise of a calendar. Each day since then I have not ceased to weep and think of my wrongs, especially the loss of my left eye, and so thinking I have felt my right eye blinded by tears so that I could not see, and have not been able to resist saying over the following stanzas of the poet it was only after the blow I knew my sorrow could hurt me so, how then could Allah know? I will abide those whips of his that the world may know iniquities more bitter than patience is. Patience has beauty, I've understood, when it is practiced by one of the good, but fate is a thing more rude. For fate was probably setting a snare when you were born, wherever you were, to take your old feet there. She knew the secrets of my bed and more than so, but she lay dead. The genie cut off her head. Dot to him who prats of joy down here say, Soon you'll taste a day bitter as the quick sap of the myrrh. I left that city and journeyed through many lands, aiming ever for Baghdad, the city of peace, where I hope to tell all my tale to thee. Prince of Believers. Tonight I reached Baghdad after many long and weary days. By chance I met this other calendar and while we were talking together we were joined by our third companion, also a calendar. Recognizing each other as strangers, we wended our way in the darkness together till the kind hand of destiny led us to your house, my mistress. That is the story of my shaved beard and lost eye. When she had heard the tale of the second calendar, the mistress of the house said to him, Your tale is truly strange, make your bow and depart with all speed but he answered indeed i shall not stir from here until i have heard the tale of my third companion so the third calendar advanced and said